day we gather to celebrate the birth of our Savior. This glorious intersection of the fullness of time and the fullness of purpose as we behold the birth of a newborn king. However, this beautiful picture that we see so clearly was contrasted by the waiting of an entire nation. What we fail to grasp in our yearly celebration of Christmas is that the Christmas story is one of promise fulfilled. A promise that stretched back all the way to Genesis. Yes, it's about the Savior of the world. But it was also about a promise made and a promise kept. For most of us, we know the end. We know how the story goes. And we know the person of Jesus. So it's just something we tend to do as part of our Christian faith, our Christian walk, and part of our yearly calendar. But we forget the longing and the waiting, the courage that was required in the midst of uncertainty. It's kind of like watching a movie with a friend. You've seen the movie before, they haven't, and... You can, you can watch them go through the joy of watching the movie for the first time. But the twist ending really isn't the twist ending anymore. It's just the ending. We know the characters. We might have memorized the plot. Maybe I know a couple lines and can recite it. And the movie may move us but not in the way that it first did. Part of why the Christmas story has become normal for us is that we rush on to the end. We rush on to the point of Savior, of of the Messiah, of the promised one, and, and we skip over and don't allow ourselves to go through the process. We perceive it as information to be grasped instead of a person to encounter. In Luke 2, it says that Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. That word consolation in this context refers to the promised Messiah. To console is to alleviate grief or to take away a sense of loss or trouble. So imagine with me for a moment what it was like to be in their shoes. It had been 400 years since the Lord had spoken to the nation of Israel. Some of us go a month without hearing his voice and think that he's forsaken us. Israel had 400 years of that. Imagine the pain of not hearing the Father's voice for 400 years. That is a minimum of four generations that hadn't heard his voice. And that's if everyone lived to 100. So my great, great grandfather might have known what it was for the Lord to speak to the nation. They are currently living off of someone else's memory of what the Lord sounded like. Not only that, but they are currently under Roman occupation, meaning that they have been conquered as a nation. That's kind of like if America decided tomorrow, we want Canada. And they, they, they send their troops, they conquer us as a nation, 
And for, for 60 years, we've been sending tax to America. And that's apart from the oppression and the hardship that occupation brings. The Romans were ruling for almost 60 years at this point, which doesn't include the previous empires that had conquered them. So they have a government that they did not choose, probably a sense of being abandoned by God, or at the very least, questioning where he was. To say it lightly, they were in need of consolation and comfort. They probably had a deep sense of unmet longing to be saved by someone that had been promised long ago. Can you begin to feel that deep sense of pain that's attached to the story? This is where we pick up the story with Anna and Simeon. This moment, this moment of pain and of crisis and of longing and of hope deferred. And I love this story because for me it underlines the access that we all have to the king. Though we are all offered it, I think sometimes we can all miss it. The problem for most of us is an access, as we all get the same access to God. I don't, I don't stand here this morning with more access to heaven than you do. Jesus paid for equal access for all. So what then determines who gets to experience heaven and who doesn't? Who gets to experience the kingdom and who doesn't? Jesus? <laughs> I would suggest to you that one of the keys to seeing Jesus is hunger. Because hunger allowed Anna and Simeon to see what others could not. I wonder if others were given the same opportunity to see the king, but turned it down. Wanting consolation, but not believing it had come, let alone through a child on a bed of hay. How often do we reject the things of heaven that we don't perceive as meaningful? By all accounts, both Anna and Simeon would have been validated in their unbelief. Culturally, it would have been accepted if they were disillusioned or if they were angry at their present circumstances. You see, longing has this tendency to remove us from the very thing that we are waiting for. It drives us to this place of hunger and desperation. It keeps us in this space of vulnerability, which we are prone to remove ourselves from. We grow weary and waiting and choose to give up or get bitter because the Lord didn't come through when or how we wanted him to. However, it's, it's not what happens to us as much as it's our heart posture within our circumstances that matter. The same hot water that hardens the egg softens the potato. This doesn't discount or invalidate what we go through, but I think 
It underlines the choice that each one of us gets in the midst of it. It's the same process of waiting that not only refines us, but also qualifies us to receive our reward. Both Anna and Simeon were able to stay present and hungry in the midst of waiting. They didn't allow their hearts to be hardened by the problem, but kept what the Lord had spoken in front of them. Some some might say that's grace, but I would submit that they continued to make a choice even when their circumstances told them to choose otherwise. Notice what it says in verse 29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Simeon is saying, now I can die. Because I have seen the fulfillment of the very thing which you have promised. Simeon kept the promise in front of him. Anna kept the promise in front of her. Hunger not only keeps us from the offense of the age but also positions us to experience the King of Kings. The things that have my affection will always guide my attention. And what I keep in front of my my heart will always have me. That's why it's important to keep our hearts and our vision fixated on the promise that he has spoken. In this way, I don't become disillusioned in the waiting, in the anticipating. Because in the midst of the waiting, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of unfulfilled promise, we can allow our affection and our hunger to guide us into what he has promised. Because when we make ourselves vulnerable in hunger, we make ourselves vulnerable to experience our Savior. 